Yo, yo, and welcome back to the Megaton Retrospect. We are about, what, we got like two more games after this one, and right now we're making the full dive onto the 3DS, a console that was interesting, to say the least. Besides the fact that games for this console were uh, few and far between when it first released, throughout its lifetime, the 3DS had a lot of great JRPGs. Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance, the Persona Q games, Bravely the Default, and many more, but it also brought us games to help bring further exposure to series that were more well known in Japan, like Fire Emblem Awakening, and the subject of today's video, Shin Megami Tensei 4. Released on July 16, 2013, the game has us playing as Flynn, a new samurai alongside three others who are given the task of tracking down the Black Samurai, during which mysteries and revelations are revealed that changes their outlook on everything. Now, as I mentioned back in the Strange Journey video, Kanako ended up stepping down as the demon and character designer for Megaten and took a smaller role in the series. Now, the last known contribution he did make to Megaten was a scenario draft which became the blueprint for the story of SMT4. And if y'all ever get a chance, I would recommend reading this to, just to see what could have been. It's largely the same, but some details like the events prior to the game would have been something we as the players would have experienced. On the development side of things, 4 began development after the release of Strange Journey, and originally the team was going to develop the game for the Nintendo DS using the same engine Strange Journey used. But around that time, they were introduced to the 3DS, which led to them having to make a whole new engine for the game. Now, the team involved has some of the old members, such as Kazuyuki Yamai, who was acting as the director for the game, and Eiji Ishida, who was acting as the art director. But it also has some new members who haven't worked on the mainline Megaton game before. In the music department, we had Toshiki Konishi and Kenichi Chushia from the Trauma Center games as composers, with Chushia also being the sound director for 4. But the one that new fans might be more familiar with is Ryota Kazuka. Now, if you have me make a top 10 gaming composers of all time, Kazuka will be high on that list because of how good his music is. Finally, on the art side of things, we ended up getting Masayuki Doi as the new character designer. He originally came from the Trauma Center games like Konishi and Shushia, but he is often talked about in comparison to Kaneko. Some will say that Doi's art is really good, and others thinks it's shit. For me, I am of the former, as Doi's art is unique on its own, especially for the human characters. And while he wouldn't be the demon designer until the next game, all the new demon designs were done by various artists. There isn't much though, because a huge chunk of the other demons in the game uses designs from Kanago. And the reception for this game was pretty positive. Critics liked a lot of aspects of the game besides certain parts of the gameplay and certain parts of the story. But when you look at the fans' reaction to this game, holy shit, they really love this game. You know how there are people who be singing praises for games like Final Fantasy VII, Breath of the Wild, and honestly, any other critically beloved game? Well, this is the same case for Megaton fans. Like, I remember hearing so much about it a couple months after its release. And honestly, if you were to look this game up on here, Every video has somebody singing praises for it. It's like Kingdom Hearts fans when Kingdom Hearts 2 came out, or Tekken fans when Tekken 3 came out, or you get the point, right? As for me, this is actually my first time playing Shin Megami Tensei 4, despite having watched videos on it in the past. <laughs> I've tried in the past to emulate this game, and every time I did, my laptop and or phone would end up sounding like a damn jet turbine. But after last month, I was finally able to experience this game. But my god was writing this script hard as hell to do. This script took me a week and a half to do, where normally I need only about two days to do so. This was mainly because of how I wanted to explain the story, some of the events that happened within it, and the gameplay alongside me rewriting parts of the script because I hated how the original one sounded. Now, what you're hearing right now is a more improved script, the one that kind of just rolls off the tongue, the one that you probably be like, okay, I can actually say this stuff. Because, yeah, that actually was a problem with my last script. It took me damn near uh, three hours to record. This video was not fun to make. 
Despite this though, I'm still gonna have to apologize in advance just in case I forget to mention something or misunderstand an event. This game has so much shit going on and by the time I got to writing this script, it felt like my brain was gonna implode in any second. Like always, there will be a timestamp if you guys don't wanna be spoiled. And with that being said, let's get into the dick of it. The game begins with a weird dream sequence that feels awfully familiar, just about the weird red hallway. During the sequence, we get to name our character, and for the synopsis, we'll be referring to his default name, Flynn. After experiencing cryptic shit on top of more cryptic shit, the game begins proper with us in the medieval land known as the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado, with today being a special day, as the rite of passage is going down, where if somebody gets accepted by the gauntlet, then they'll become a bona fide samurai. Prepare to hear that a lot. We end up going with our friend Issachar, and while he doesn't get accepted by the gauntlet, Flynn does, and we begin the first few hours learning how to become samurai. During this, we end up meeting Walter and Jonjin, who we saw in our dream, alongside Isabu and everybody's favorite dickhead, Navar, who puts us through a damn warrior having to save him from the demon Alarune after his little ego was hurt. While in the demon's domain, we end up seeing Steven again. Hey, I haven't seen you since... SMT9? Ah, fuck. Uh, do I gotta review that now? Mm. After that shit show, Flynn, Walter, and Jonathan are given the day off where they soon learn that the casualties of Mikado have been given literature in order to spread knowledge across the kingdom. But this letter ends with some of the people turning into demons in Flynn's hometown, with Issachar being among the many victims. The one responsible for this is known as the Black Samurai, who was fitted with a black demonica from Strange Journey. And no, the games are not connected, as far as I know. After the incident, the higher ups of the kingdom put out a bounty for anyone who could find and capture the Black Samurai, leading to Flynn, Walter, Jonathan, and Isabu going down the depths of Naraku to track them down. During their trek through Naraku, they end up encountering everyone's favorite boss, Minotaur and Medusa. And after getting out of that hellhole, we end up in the Unclean Ones territory, i.e. Tokyo. Now before we continue, I kind of already have an idea of what type of questions you guys are going to be asking. Like what happened to Tokyo? Why is it under this like rock-like dome? And what the fuck happened prior to this that leaded to this moment? All mysteries that will eventually be uncovered. Eventually. As Flynn and the others are searching for the Black Samurai, we end up getting a nice chunk of world building, learning the fucked up situation that these people are going through, and the three organizations that reside within Tokyo. First is the Ashurakai, a Yakuza group trying to create a semblance of order by supplying demons with these things known as red pills. Second is the good old Ring of Gaia, the group that believes strength is everything, and without it, you might as well die. And finally is the Hunters Association, whose main mission is to gather those willing to fight off against the demons and protect the people of Tokyo. After doing some cleanup missions in Jinjuku, we get directed to Ikebukuro where the Black Samurai might be. However, we get caught in the middle of a mission where the Ring of Gaia is trying to stop a demon named... Ooh, uh... After helping the last few survivors on the mission, we eventually encounter the Black Samurai and later arrest her. After taking her back to Mikado, she is set to be executed, but before dying, she gets an ominous warning that everything is in motion, and she will eventually be resurrected. After the execution, we meet with Sister Gabby, who gives us a mission to save some important people being held hostage in the Kagome Tower. Shortly after completing it, they're given one more mission regarding the Black Samurai, as it's revealed that she was resurrected, and it's now our mission to kill her once and for all. But upon coming to Tokyo, we end up meeting with Tayama, the leader of the Ashurakai, after he held one of our samurai brethren hostage. He forces us to kill a demon disturbing his business, and later requests for us to kill Yuriko, the head of the Ring of Gaia. After going through some trials to prove our strength to them, we end up coming across the Black Samurai, who's also revealed to be Yuriko. Recognize the name? Nope. Alright. Roll it. I am Lilith. Yeah, and it only continues from here. Yuriko is revealed to be Lilith and goes on a monologue spree talking about restoring the world to its natural order, where the strong can shape the world as they please. Jonathan basically says, fuck that, and tries to kill Lilith, but is stopped by Walter, who wants to hear more of what she has to say. 
She persuades the group to head to an underground facility in the Rapungi Hills to witness true evil. Before heading there, we get guided by a girl named Hikaru to Shinjuku, where we meet Fujiwara and Skins, the people responsible for the creation of the Hunters Association. He ends up giving us advice on how to reach Rapungi Hills, but the moment we head over there and go down the basement, we end up witnessing the most fucked up shit imaginable. The group learns that Tayama's red pills are being created by kidnapping children, yes, children, and taking their neurotransmitters as an ingredient. Sorry, what the fuck? After being KO'd by sleeping gas and talking with Tayama, we get directed to go to Shinduke where we meet up with sister Gabby, and it's revealed that she and the dream men that we rescued from Kagome Tower are the Archangels. They end up detailing their plan as the new leaders of Mikado to basically kill everything in Tokyo. Demons, humans, hell, probably even dogs. All I know is that they want that shit gone expeditiously. Oh, and they even went as far as to kill the king of Mikado after they believed that he failed his duties as one. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? After the meeting, Jonathan and Walter go their separate ways, and we're given a choice to go with one or the other. Now, going with Jonathan sees us fighting Lilith, meanwhile, siding with Walter sees us being directed to the Yamato reactor in Camp Ishigaya, which is not only being used to provide electricity to Tokyo, but it's also being used to bring demons from the expanse. Regardless, the dream meet up at the Yamato reactor with Walter pressing the button and sending us through what might just be the craziest moment in Megaton that I've experienced so far. Now this part of the script is what took me a little bit to get through because that whole event was not registering inside my head. But I should be able to do it now. Maybe. Eh, fuck it, we'll see how we do. Mm. After activating the reactor, we come across these weird versions of characters we met throughout the story, known as the Whites. Now these guys are a group of people who have observed humanity and fearing that we're doomed to repeat history, want to basically nuke the entire cosmos. But before they do anything, they decide to put us through alternate versions of Tokyo that represent law and chaos as a way to persuade us to their cause. We first end up in a sort of messed up desert known as Blasted Tokyo, a version of the world in which the angels won the war against the demons 25 years ago and eradicated both them and Tokyo. Now in order to weed out the last remaining sinners, God decided to leave a little gift in the form of Pluto, a robot designed to kill those who are sinners with poison. We end up helping Akira and the last remaining survivors of this Tokyo by defeating Pluto, and later we learn that this Akira would eventually be the same person that would create the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado. And before you say anything, this is an alternate world. Just because it happened in our timeline and shit does not mean it happened in there. It's weird, I know, but it's going to make sense eventually. We get the button to the Yamato reactor and get sent to one last version of Tokyo, this time engulfed in fire. This is known as Infernal Tokyo, where demons won the war against the angels 25 years ago and have now occupied Tokyo. In addition, humanity has split into two parties. First are the demonoids, which are half-human, half-demon hybrids, and second is the nourishers, humans who basically live as food for the demonoids. Now, in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, we see a version of Akira that is of the former group and wants to become the king of Tokyo, even though he's a pussy. Now, in order to do so, we gotta beat this cyber chase looking motherfucker named Kenji, which after an annoying-ass battle, we managed to do so. After using the Yamato reactor one last time, we end up encountering the Whites again, who gives us our classic alignment choices, alongside a fourth option to just, well, nook everything into high hell. And, you know, for me, I gotta go for the neutral route, despite me only going to the chaos route for my boy Walter. See, now I'm just gonna pick my ending, and, uh, why the hell am I seeing Jonna? Oh, Christ, this is that game, huh? In most SMT games, getting the alignment you won wasn't exactly hard to do. SMT2 might be the only exception due to you being law aligned for, like, the majority of the game. But nah, 4 takes the cake for having the most annoying ass process to get in the ending you want, as every choice you make in this game is treated like a major choice that can easily change your alignment. Now, the Law and Chaos endings are somewhat easy as you need to get a full positive or a full negative score, but getting the neutral ending is the biggest pain in the ass imaginable. In order to get this ending, you need to stay between plus 8 and minus 8, meaning nothing higher and nothing lower. And you have to do some very specific shit to get around this range, as you have to pick the first option whenever you're given a choice, 
Always go left during the maze of Tsukiji, choose to destroy the status quo without choosing to become the true messiah, and avoid doing things that have the chance to change your alignment, especially with some of the challenge quests, and this bitch in Ikebukuro being able to easily fuck up your run. Major emphasis on this bitch from Ikebukuro, don't talk to her. Trust me, I ended up having to do some hex editing in order to get the neutral ending. If you end up in the same predicament I have, I suggest looking up on how to do it. Or better yet, link below on how to do it. Cool? Okay, let's continue on. Of course, depending on the choice you make and what your alignment is, you'll either side with Jonathan or Walter. And in my case, I went for the neutral ending. And prepare yourself for a mindfuck here. After making our choice, we end up meeting Steven again, who taxes us with finding and killing the whites that we encountered earlier. After doing so, we end up learning that the little girl we saw in our dream, and we were in Elora's domain, is the goddess of Tokyo. Alongside that, we learned that the dome over Tokyo was created 25 years ago, when a member of the Counter Demon Force fused himself with Masakado to protect the city from a war that was about to be waged between the demons and angels. The man that fused with Masakado would eventually reincarnate as Flynn. Yep. Reincarnation is back. After what, like 20 years, give or take? Damn. We get transported back to the real world with Isabu telling us that the war between the angels and demons is about to go down. We end up meeting with Fujiwara and Skins, who gives us a sword that can be used to awaken Masakado. After awakening him, he sends us on a mission to fill a chalice with the hope of the people of Tokyo in order to get his strength back. After doing so, he ends up helping us in trying to stop this war. We first end up fighting Jonathan, who has joined with the Archangels and merged with the Angel Merkaba to destroy everything in Tokyo to avoid humanity being corrupted even further. After defeating him, we now gotta fight Walter, who has merged with no one else but Lucifer himself, as he wants to open up Naraku to set demons out in the wild. Also, interesting fact, Nikoto was Lucifer in disguise. That clever bastard. We defeat Walter and Masakado uses his powers to destroy the dome allowing for the people of Mikado and Tokyo to live together. Oh, and one last surprise is that Boros, our AI companion throughout the whole entire game, was the goddess of Tokyo. Or piece of her. Hell man, honestly, I don't even know. Jesus, oh god. What the fuck just happened? SMT4's story is something to say the least. The game's story content is similar to SMT2, just with a lot more shit going on. But what this game does better than 2, in my opinion, is the overall mystery. Now, 4 sets a lot of clues throughout the story, and if you were to go and explore a bit more in some areas, you end up learning more about the events prior and get subtle clues to stuff that gets revealed in the end. And compared to the neutral route in other games, this one feels the most rewarding, despite the shit you go through. And the thing is, is that it gives you a bunch of satisfying bombshells, which may not have surprised some, but it sure as hell surprised me. Learning that Flynn is the reincarnation of the hero who fused with Masakado, and the bombshell that Burroughs was the god of Tokyo was unexpected. With so far in this series, only two games had me shocked by some of his revelations, with them being SMT2 and Strange Journey. But the big elephant in the room for SMT veterans are the callbacks that are made throughout the entire game. I know that the goal for the team was to recreate the feeling from the first SMT game, but god damn, there are so many references to past games here. Yuriko, the Minotaur, Medusa, and so many more. And I'm pretty sure there were some references to Digital Devil Story 2, but I don't think they went back that far. Uh, most some of these could just be similarities. Speaking of references, the main cast of this game is very similar to the cast in SMT1, but unlike that cast, this one actually feel like they have more of a connection than damn near every cast from the mainline games. You see, what separates the characters here from the past SMT games are the character moments and the fact that they're with us for the majority of the game. This makes this cast in particular all the more great as the interaction builds camaraderie between them and makes the impending fight against them all the more tense. Plus, it's really easy to imagine these guys as friends, hell, maybe even close friends if situations were different. Together, they're great, but by themselves, they have issues. First is Walter, who reminds me a little bit of Jimenez. Instead of being a sarcastic asshole, Walter is a lot more blunt with his criticisms. Though, there are times where it seems like there's nothing going on inside of his head. Now, compared to the other Chaos Heroes, Walter is a lot more tame early on, and one of the things that seems to define his character is his desire to change the cast system that Mikado has. But this ends up changing, which we'll mention with the next character, Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is the law rep for the story and is a foil to Walter. Where he wants things to change in Mikado, Jonathan wants things to stay the same. 
But beyond that, he isn't too different from the past law heroes. Hell, he has most of the markings of a typical law hero. Though, this time, add a little bit of your standard evangelical Christian into the mix. The things about these two that I wasn't exactly a fan of is that they still fall into the typical law and chaos ideologies at the end, which could have worked if they changed what each side wanted. Now, Walter goes from someone wanting to change society to where everyone is equal to full on social Darwinism, and Jonathan, well, he goes full on evangelical Christian on us. Next thing you know, he might pull up with the Westboro Baptist Church. Now, I was hoping to see a change in the ideology of the alignments, but despite my criticisms, I do really like the early bits of their character and was surprised that they were straight up talking about class issues. Now, if I remember correctly, they might have done this in the other SMT games, but I can't say for sure. Finally is Isabu, who... Oh, uh, doesn't really do a lot, especially in the late game. She serves as the neutral rep who is dependent on Flynn when it comes to certain choices. Hell, in terms of how she's characterized, um, damn, the main thing I could think of is that she loves manga, acts as the mediator for the group, and, uh, yeah, that's it, honestly. The only time we see her not being dependent on Flynn is if you went down either the law or chaos route, with everything else cool about her being off screen. Overall, I really enjoyed this story and all the callbacks from the past SMT titles. The mystery that the story introduces actually was really interesting and actually kept me engaged throughout the whole entire story just to see what's going to happen next. Character-wise, though, they don't really have shit on Strange Journey, but if Atlas had changed some stuff, I definitely would be singing a different tune. The only problem that I had was the pacing, which felt inconsistent at points. The intro is long, but after that happens, the game starts going and going, and then stops a bit after the Black Samurai is executed, and then from there, everything is full speed ahead to the end, which did throw me off, but it didn't kill my overall enjoyment of the story. And you want to know something funny? With all the story callbacks that we've gotten so far, it also kind of seeps into the gameplay a bit, but alongside with some new changes that are, uh... Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy. Before we talk about the changes, let's get to the basics real quick. SMT4 goes back to the third person perspective seen in Nocturne, but now enemies actually appear at these digital blob thingies instead of it being random encounters. If you hit them before they touch you, then you can deal some early damage, though uh, don't let them catch you or they'll strike first and if you have my luck, then 9 times out of 10 you're gonna get your shit rocked. When you get into battle, you'll see that press turn is back and works exactly like how it did in Nocturne. Now for those new to the series, in which real quick, hi, what's good? Hope y'all are doing the video so far. The way press turn works is if you hit an enemy's weakness or get a critical hit, then you can get an extra turn and even stack them up if you keep exploring the enemy's weakness. And if you manage to dodge an enemy's attack, null, absorb, or reflect it, then the enemy will lose either two or all of their turns. Pretty simple, right? But in order to get the full four turns, you're going to need some demons. And like always, you can negotiate with demons for them to join your side and fuse them using the Cathedral Shadows app on your gauntlet. But that's just the basic stuff because in an effort to make this game accessible to new players, 4 introduces a lot of changes, ranging from being pretty good to, oh god, this is broken as all hell. And the epitome of something being broken is with the smirk effect. Now, press turn already gives off a hit of dopamine when you expose an enemy's weakness or get a critical hit. So Atlas saw this and was like, hey, let's add a new feature to press turn that the players are going to love. Thus, we have the smirk system, which from what I've seen around the internet, is the most hated addition to this game. How it works is that after hitting an enemy's weakness or getting a critical hit on them, you'll have a chance to get the smirk effect, during which you can do all of the following. It'll raise your hit rate for accuracy and critical hits. You can damn near dodge any and all attacks that enemies will draw at you. Empower your next ability, whether it be a physical attack or a support ability like buffs and debuffs. And if you get hit with your weakness, then it'll be treated as normal damage. But what makes this shit so broken is that in addition to all the stuff that I listed, if all of your active party members get smirked as well, then half of your guys' health and MP will be restored. Oh, and during the enemy's turn, you can also get the smirk effect if you null, void, absorb, or reflect their attacks. So what all of this means is that if you play your stuff right, you can win any battle by abusing this system. In short, this shit is broken. 
most of the fights will be trivialized as long as there is a way to get the smirk effect. And in my case, I ended up using either Tetracarn or Makarakron to get it. Surprisingly, it worked for like a good chunk of battles, and all of a sudden, I got my shit pushed in for some of the late game fights when they start spamming almighty moves. So despite how broken it could be for you, remember, this is press turn. So if it's broken for you, it's also broken for the enemy. Yeah. Oh, and boy, you better start praying, because if they get the smirk effect, you're not only going to see some game overs, but you're also going to be seeing red. And if you're wondering if this has a high chance of happening, yeah, because of the other new addition. During a large chunk of the game, you'll randomly have either Walter, Jonathan, or Isabu assisting you in battle. However, they're controlled by AI, meaning that we kind of have a Persona 3 situation on our hands. But they don't affect your press turn, thank fucking god, but because each of them have their own movesets, you better hope you get someone that can get the enemy's weakness. If not, you're gonna end up having an enemy with smirk, and for what I've seen so I've been through, it is not fun. The most infamous example of this going wrong is with the Minotaur fight. Enough said right there. Now the smirk effect was the biggest in a sea of changes, but so many others aren't that bad. Kind of. Now starting off with some of the good changes is with Demon Inheritance as it isn't locked behind a demon source anymore. So now when fusing a demon, you can freely choose which moves that fused demon will have with some limitations like not being able to learn certain moves. And after they learn all of their hidden moves, you'll go through a demon whispering event where you can choose any of the moves that demon has and use it for yourself. This change is probably the best change so far, as instead of these little puny elemental bullets, you're wielding actual magic, and later in the game you can actually learn some pretty powerful ass skills and even get some powerful setups going. Another new change is when it comes to death, as instead of dying and instantly getting a game over, when you die, your demons in your active party will still fight for you until they eventually kick the bucket. Afterwards, you come face to face with Karin, who will revive you for a set price, and even if you don't have the money to be revived, he'll still do so and collect it after you get the specific amount. But don't die while you have a tab with him, as if you die again, that's a game over. Now, there's more positive shit to talk about, but real quick, let's talk about one of the dumbest changes in this game being the way Maka is obtained. Instead of it being dropped from enemies after battle, Maka can now only be obtained from treasure chests selling your items, using the fun race app with his complete ass cheeks, completing challenge quests and main quests, and getting relics. Then the latter are these little green crystals which can give you different items ranging from household shit to actual gems, and they can be sold at shops and will respawn after a little while. Now on paper this isn't so bad until you actually go through it and you end up being broke for like a good chunk of the game. The quote unquote relics you collect throughout the game doesn't really give you a decent amount of money. Hell, they don't even tell you how much it is until you actually go to the shop. And so, if you want to see a decent return, you practically have to go and collect upwards of 25 of these bitches just to get your money's worth. Now earlier, I did mention challenge quests, and they are a decent way to get money, but not completely. These quests are side quests you can take at either K's Tavern or the varying hunter associations across Tokyo, and are split between six types. The first two types are Demon Slaying and Delivery Quests, which are sort of self-explanatory, with the third type being a mixture of the two. The fourth type are Escort slash Rescue Quests, which involve you having to protect whatever item slash person they need, and you gotta try to avoid battle whenever possible, because they can and will take damage. The fifth type are Training Battles, which challenges you on the mechanics of the game, and finally are the Tournaments, which are ways of battles that you gotta go through, and it's best to deal with those later because of the demons you'll come across. Now while these quests do give neat rewards, any of them with Maka as the reward are few and far between. And yep, that also means you're going to be selling some of your items, which surprisingly wasn't annoying, but just the process of being starved for Kaz throughout the whole entire game is the most annoying change in the series so far. Beyond the broken and quite frankly stupid ass changes that this game made, SMT4 is the more comfortable gameplay experience compared to Nocturne and Strange Journey, and I would instantly recommend this game to new players over Nocturne or even SMT5 if it wasn't for the difficulty spikes, which makes this the weirdest Megaton game to talk about when it comes to its difficulty, but also the gameplay loop. Now here would be the part where I would go and you know talk about my experiences throughout the game, uh, the dungeons, bosses, Little things like that. But, um, 4 kind of switches things up a bit. 
So 4 doesn't really have dungeons. It's, the, it's more mission-based, as a lot of the areas you explore are areas that you're likely going to have to revisit, and they don't really have anything major going on with them. Senjuku has multiple areas, Ikebukuro has a bunch of poison traps, and Naruku is just your standard beginning area. You could make the argument that demon domains are dungeons, but I don't know, it's weird to say the least. Now, I'm not sure if it's like this in 4 Apocalypse, but I know for 5, it, it's similar, though in 5 you're also going through like big ass areas. So for this and maybe the rest of the retrospect, I'm going to be more out there with some of the things I've been through. We'll still talk about the gameplay and the shit that I've been through, but we'll also talk about the art, music, and maybe bits of the story that I didn't mention before. Actually, never mind on that part. And before we talk about the art and gameplay, especially the fucking gameplay, Let's talk about music. I've been holding back my praise for it, but Jesus Christ, Ryota Kazuka was cooking in the kitchen with this. Every track in this game is distinct from one another, with the sound changes depending on whether or not you're in Mikado or Tokyo. Also, I apologize in advance for all my music terminology. If you do not understand it, I apologize. And that's about it. <laughs> now, Mikado being the bit evil setting it is, takes aspects from sacred and secular music, which represents the religion and casual nature of Mikado. And the areas outside of the castle represents the secular side of music, where it makes you feel like you're in the bazaar, you're just doing your daily stuff. But the moment you reach Mikado Castle is when things start changing, as the sacred and secular music starts to kind of like morph or separate, depending on where you are. Now, if you're in any of the areas where the samurai were at, then you will hear that mixture of sacred and secular that kind of gives you the sense of honor and duty. Then when you get into the monastery, it is straight up sacred music with it using heterophonic melodies all around. But the moment you step away from Mikado is when the music really starts changing. Each area has their own distinct sound and makes a lot of these areas stand out. The sound in Naruku does a great job of creating this tense and unknown atmosphere and like you don't know what's going to be coming out around the corner or what's going to pop up in front of you. In the Tokyo, man, that one has this constant feeling of discovery. It's like going to a foreign country and feeling a sense of wonder when looking at the sights. Now, the soundtrack as a whole does a really great job using these synths and other instruments to give off this post-apocalyptic vibe to it. But then there's some songs that remind me of the soundtrack for Soul Hackers, and for that matter, some of these tracks also have callbacks to past games. Jesus, I swear this game is callback central. Now, I love the music in a lot of these areas, but my personal favorite comes from the shops and the boss themes. The shop music has a lot of different layers with it having a nice simple drum pattern, chill melodies, and vocals that with the drum pattern blends itself nicely. Then you got the Hunters Association, which is just groovy as all hell. And as it progresses, you hear these vocals that makes it feel like you're just chilling in the lounge. Now, the battle music is good, but the boss music, now that is on some different shit. You got some guitar riffs here, and I think you got some uh, church bells, and for some reason, you'll also hear a little bit of drum and bass. Plus, there is variety in this soundtrack with different battle themes for different situations, which is a nice touch of detail, I guess. I don't know, it's still pretty cool. In general, this soundtrack is great, but is it Kazuka's best work? In my opinion, that would have to be his work on SSD 5, but we'll see if 4 Apocalypse changes my mind. We'll see. So how about them demon designs? Most of the demon designs in this game were done by Kanako, while all the new designs were done by various artists who I am for sure going to butcher some of their names, but I'm gonna try my best. These new artists involve Yasuhi Nirasawa, Tomosu Shinohara, Keitak Amimiya, who, fun fact, was the character designer for some of the Animusha games in Clock Tower 3, Yoshihiro Nishimura, and Kiyuma Aki. Now, in an interview with Famitsu, one of the biggest inspirations for the new demon designs was Yumai's love for Tokusatsu shows. Yeah, if it already wasn't clear, a lot of these guys look straight out of a Kamen Rider, Power Ranger, and honestly, any other Tokusatsu show that you can think of. But other than the inspirations, I do like how some of these guys look. As Modius looks a whole lot better than his design in Digital Devil Story 2, because now he actually looks threatening. But the Archangels, now they spooked the fuck out of me when I first saw them. I wasn't sure if they were supposed to represent biblically accurate angels or what, but whatever the inspiration for their design was, this shit is uncanny. 
Then there's Lucifer, whose first form looks like someone trying to compensate for something, and suddenly he turns into an eldritch being who wants to destroy the world. Now my only issue is how they appear during battle. And it seems like the boss battles had the best work done, as when it comes to the normal battles, they don't really hold a candle to them. I would have preferred seeing these demons in 3D, but considering that this was on the 3DS, I can't be mad over it. Finally, the good old gameplay was really drew me for a fucking loop. Of course, we need to talk about the difficulty spikes, but there's a couple other things that happened that annoyed the hell out of me during my playthrough. The first thing was traversing the world map was, was the most annoying thing I went through since SMT1. The map is hard to make out and for the later portions of the game you gotta go out your way to find some of these areas. It isn't too bad if one of these areas has a terminal nearby, but uh, other than that good luck trying to find an area you need for the main story or specifically the side quest. Speaking of which, I mentioned before that the neutral ending was harder to get, but it's also the one that requires the most work. Now, in order to get Masakado's power back, you have to get the hope of the people of Tokyo and a chalice. But in order to do so, you have to complete challenge quests. The problem is, these motherfuckers won't tell you which ones to do. Without a guide, you won't really know what challenge quest fills the chalice, nor the fact you gotta do every hunter's association in order to do it. Luckily, you got me in this handy form post right here. There's 18 overall to do with some involving Azomi, who I think was supposed to have a bigger role in the story, but I'm not too sure about that. I'll include the link to the quest you need to do to make your life so much easier so that you don't slam your head into the wall like I did. But let's talk about one of the biggest contributors towards the difficulty spike, the fucking bosses. Earlier I mentioned that this game has some weird difficulty spikes, but what I didn't tell you was that it all comes from the bosses nothing else. Now at least with some of the other games I can tell you or at least pinpoint where the difficulty spike is. Like for Nocturne it's weird because like the enemy AI varies from being like brain dead to being fucking Albert Einstein and it can happen like in a snap. One moment you're going up against someone who's just you know dumb <laughs> and stuff and then you're going against the other motherfucker who's out here playing 4D chess on you. Yeah but when it comes to SMT4 though, the bosses are the only reason why this game is difficult as hell. And let's start with everyone's favorite boss, the Minotaur, who I beat on my first try. So like what, this is the uh, second or third time something seen as difficult wasn't exactly difficult? Man, I am mad disappointed. Then again, the biggest reason I was able to beat this boss was not having Walter in my party and grinding a bit. Thank fucking god. But the same can't be said for Medusa. Fuck this bitch. Early on she has this combo where if she hits you with Ziyunga, it snowballs into Snake's thing, which causes members of your party to be binded, which is beyond annoying. Unlike Minotaur, Medusa took me about 4-5 to five tries, especially because I forgot to save before the fight. This kids is why you should always save when playing an RPG. After Medusa, all the other bosses were easier to an extent. Some of them were annoying but manageable once you get an idea of how their moves work. But once you get to Blasted Slash Infernal Tokyo, is when they become difficult as hell again. The bosses I had trouble with in the late game were Pluto, Kenji, and Lucifer, who despite being susceptible to Tetracron and Makarakron, was so damn annoying to deal with. And to add to the pain, these guys, especially Lucifer, were done in easy mode. And somehow, someway, I still struggled against them. Starting with Pluto, he has an almighty spell known as Vulnera, which can be chained and dealt up to 250 damage. And the motherfucker can also bind your party members as well. Fuck. He took me a minute to beat as even though I was using Tetracon and Makarakron, when it got to half health, the motherfucker started nuking my shit. Also, this is a common trend, so just prepare for that. Next is Kenji, who wasn't as hard as Pluto, but blindsided my ass a couple times. The main thing that was annoying from him is that he has over 8,000 HP, which took me a minute to break down because he was like a damn tank. And just like Pluto, he can also chain almighty spells, which is beyond fucking annoying. But then, we have the last boss, Lucifer, who can fuck himself. Now what's weird about Lucifer is that Merkaba was so much easier than this motherfucker, who was reminding me of his final boss fight in Digital Devil Story. 
that's how bad it is. Now his moves hurt like hell, and even when using Tetracron or Makarakron, there were moments where he would draw some other attacks and I wouldn't even be prepared for it. But the worst of this is a move called Morningstar. This is yet another almighty skill that could take off between 250 to 450 HP. But the thing is, the damage is random, so you might be fine at one point, or you'll get fucked up in the next part. But the second phase isn't better because he gets stronger even with the prompts that will help you out. With that said, were any of these bosses at least fun? No, not even the slightest bit fun. Maybe the ones in the middle after Medusa and before Pluto, but even then, those guys were equally as annoying. And you want to know what makes this even more annoying or all the bosses even more annoying? The smirk effect. If any of these guys get the smirk effect, then your chances of survival went from 90% to zero. God, I fucking hate Smirk. So, trying to kind of like bring up my thoughts and words for this game took me a while to do. Uh, beyond, you know, the bombshells and just kind of just like thinking about my experience and how I enjoyed it. Uh, there's a lot that I wanted to say about SSD4. There's a lot of things that I love. And I honestly think that this game is great. It's so close to being amazing even. But the problem is, is that this game is... <laughs> the game's gameplay killed it for me. The story feels like a better and improved version of SFT 2 story. There's always something going on, whether it be the world building or moments leading into the next big event. And the mystery itself was great and had a satisfying payoff when you get to the end game. Gameplay, however, is mixed as all hell. Most of the mainline games had something broken with it, sure, I understand, but a lot of the ideas here that should have worked ranged from being okay in execution to being broken as all hell. And of course, the stupid ass money change, which my god made the track through this game very annoying. I know I'm using annoying a lot, but just deal with it. Overall, SCT 4 is great, but it's held back by its gameplay. Now, if it was approved in a future port to be more balanced and revert some of these changes, it would be even better. Wink wink Atlas. Now, if this was the most recent SCT game, I would say that I'm somewhat confident in the future of the series. But we do have two more games to cover. And oh boy, are they some decisive ones. And now for the good old question that I ask every video, should you play Shin Megami Tensei 4? Yes, no doubt about it. Now, despite my issues with the gameplay, I can't deny that SFT4 is a great choice for new fans trying to get into the series. Now, it's beginner friendly, and there's a lot of guides and posts if you're stuck on the particular part of the game. Now, as for buying the physical version or just buying it in general, if you want to get yourself a physical copy, make sure to get that shit before it gets even more expensive. As of now, it's around like $60 to $65, which is actually not too bad would pay less but it is what it is and if you want to own it digitally you have until march 27th to do so and if you uh procrastinate then you know there's other means i can't endorse but wink wink and with that thank you guys so much for watching until the end of the video i do want to thank you guys not only for getting me to over 300 subscribers after posting that trauma center video but also for being patient with me while I was trying to get this video out and stuff. Things are still hitting the fan right now, but we are all doing fine. I'm hoping that things begin to slow down with college and everything else so far so that I can get back to actively making videos for you guys. Hopefully, Four Apocalypse doesn't take too long. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, this, is, this is some shit. But next on the docket is probably one of the most decisive games in the series so far, that being Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. Though, to be honest, I am looking forward to playing it. And yeah, that that's going to be an interesting one. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. Hit the bell notification so you guys know when the next video is going to be coming out. And make sure to stay safe, wear a mask because it's getting crazy out there. And... I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.